Hello and welcome to the West Country CSI July webinar. My name is Lydia Deacon and I am an Evidence and Engagement Officer for the West Country Rivers Trust. The West Country Rivers Trust is an environmental charity based down in the South West working to restore and protect our water environments for both people and wildlife. We are part of the Greater Rivers Trust movement and have been running for over 25 years now. Five of those years, the West Country Citizen Science Investigation has been running and we now have over 3,000 samples taken by dedicated volunteers across the South West. They are taking observational surveys as well as water quality samples and it's really valuable for creating a picture of the state of our rivers. Over the summer, we have been running a webinar series and this is our July webinar presented by Ian Townsend of the West Country Rivers Trust. Okay, thanks very much, Lydia. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time out to uh, come to this event today. Um, I am indeed Ian Townsend, also known as Mr. T. I work in the monitoring team with Simon and Lydia uh, and joined the trust about 15 months ago. Um, so my background is uh, I trained as an organic chemist, so I, I am that unusual beast in the Rivers Trust movement. I'm actually really I'm an environmental chemist. I trained as an organic chemist uh, more years ago than I care to remember. Uh, I worked uh, initially in the pharmaceutical industry but then I worked uh, for the best part of 30 years uh, in analytical and environmental chemistry uh, in the water industry. So um, hence uh, the, the, the title of this talk is fairly close to my heart, uh, Rivers, which is something I love, and the drinking water cycle, which is something that uh, I've, I've worked in connection with for a very long time. So um, let's get going. Um, I'd like to start with a question really, and that is what does our work contribute to? And when I say our work, I mean everyone associated with the West Country Rivers Trust. So those of us who are lucky enough to work for the organisation, but also uh, people like yourselves, but valued volunteers. What, what, what does our work really produce? Well, I think something we'd all be well aware of is we've, we have an interest in conserving and improving the fantastic rivers we've got in our region. And there's an example of one that's uh, that's the River Barl up on the edge of Exmoor near Dolverton, not far from Tar Steps. And I, and I know that would that kind of work would be very high profile in the mind of, of all you guys. But also something that perhaps may not be quite so prominent in your minds is actually what we do has quite a significant impact in the area of drinking water in the, the cost effective and the sustainable uh, provision of drinking water, so a very important thing to all of us. Water is actually pretty pre precious stuff, so a couple of in some ways fairly alarming stats is out of all the water on the planet, only 3% of it is fresh water. And of that 3%, only about a sixth of that, so half a percent overall, is accessible fresh water, which is usable for the production of drinking water. Uh, uh, the other two and a half percent is essentially locked up in things like polar ice caps, glaciers, or is present in uh, very deep groundwater aquifers that are, aren't accessible for the production of drinking water. And that means really that we need to be very careful and prudent in how we use those raw water sources. And we need to do everything we can to minimise wastage, whether that be water companies limiting leakage, or us as individuals being careful how we use water uh, in our everyday lives. But also something that contribute, can contribute very much to the uh, conservation and, and appropriate use of water is, um, is, is optimising land management uh, practices uh, and also the management of, of water bodies. And that's the sort of area that organisations like WRT uh, are very active in. So if we look at the water resources of southwest England, there's a very interesting contrast uh, in, in uh, the way they are sourced. 
uh, in the two main uh, water company areas of the peninsula. So in the southwest water area, you know, in the far in the far west, water is almost wholly surface derived. Only about 10% of supplies come from groundwater sources and they're overwhelmingly in the area I'm talking to you from now in East Devon. By in stark contrast, in, in the Wessex water region, that stats almost exactly uh, reversed. So the vast majority of, of supplies are groundwater derived, about 80%. And mo that's most of the water supplies really in Dorset and Wiltshire. And it's only in Somerset, particularly West Somerset, South Somerset, where surface water is used for the widely used for the production of drinking water. And that would be sourced from areas such as uh, Exmoor, the Brendan Hills, uh, the Quantucks. So that's that's quite a stark contrast. And that's really driven by principally by the geology of, of the areas. So in groundwater areas, the impermeable uh, bedrock tends to be overlaid with uh, porous rock like limestone, chalk, uh, sandstone, which is good at holding uh, groundwater that can then be accessed and pumped to the surface for treatment. And in, whereas in surface water areas, that bedrock doesn't have that have that sort of overlying uh, 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 rock strata, and therefore uh, supplies have to be surface water derived from rivers, reservoirs, etc. So where do um, drinking water, where is drinking water actually sourced? Well, as I've just said, it can be from surface water or groundwater supplies. So uh, surface waters can come from things such as rivers, lakes, reservoirs, sometimes canals, whereas groundwaters are sourced from boreholes, wells and springs. Uh, and on that slide there are one or two um, pictures of local interest at the top there. That canal actually isn't used for drinking water supply, but I actually put it in the presentation to keep Liddy and Simon happy because that's the that's the Bude Canal, which is somewhere very close to their hearts. Uh, that's the beautiful uh, River Foy at Resprin Bridge near Lanhydrock on the top left. And I'm sure many of you will recognise that dam on the reservoir at, at the bottom. That's Burrator Reservoir. Now in the centre there, that is the inside of Southwest Water's new flagship water treatment works uh, up on Robra Down Mayflower Water Treatment Works, which is gradually coming online and replacing Crown Hill Water Treatment Works in supplying the Greater Plymouth area, and that uses a completely novel treatment process uh, in in the West Country. Maybe that's something for us to have a look at on another occasion. So what about now looking a little more closely, please forgive me if you live in the Wessex water region, but uh, the majority of people who uh, work for us obviously do live in the southwest water area. Uh, and I'd like to just look a little closer at the supply strategy for drinking water in southwest England. That actually centres around three major reservoirs and they're marked on that map there with the red stars. So moving from west to east, there's Colliford up on the top of uh, up on the top of Bodmin Moor, uh, Roadford, which is the largest uh, surface water reservoir in the southwest water area, uh, located between Lanson and Oakhampton, down in the far west of Devon, and then up on the Devon Somerset border, there's Wimbledon Reservoir, and some of the water from Wimbledon is actually used. Uh, by Wessex Water as well, so that supplies both both, re uh, both regions. All, all three of those reservoirs have things called pump recharge schemes. So this is where in times of high flow, uh, mainly in late autumn and in the winter, water, surface water have a, a license to pump water from the river up into the reservoirs if necessary to make sure they are nice and full at the start of the uh, season when drinking water demand goes up, so the late spring and into the summer. That's obviously not, a, well I say obviously, it isn't a particularly sustainable thing to do uh, because obviously there are there are associated costs with uh, uh, pump all that pumping and, and they are not just financial, there's also an increased carbon footprint. So that's something that 
uh, they try to avoid unless it's absolutely necessary. There are a whole network of smaller reservoirs around the region, which I'm sure many will be familiar with. Some, uh, some of them already mentioned Burrator, for example, uh, and they also play an important role uh, in supplying the region's drinking water. But these three strategic reservoirs are certainly the most important ones of all. Um, as we've already said, in, in the far east of the region, there are numerous smaller borehole sources particularly in the otter uh, and the axe catchments. Something that's obviously a primary concern is the pollution of drinking water sources. And so what, what sort of areas can pollution come from? Well, there are a whole plethora of them, really. I've just highlighted a few of the major ones here. Uh, things like landfill sites, uh, wastewater discharges from wastewater treatment works, industrial inputs, domestic derived pollution, road runoff, and of course agriculture. And, and pollution can be either diffuse or a point source in nature. So um, diffuse pollution is pollution that occurs really not from any well established but single source. Uh, but if you add together all of the inputs, small inputs, they, they, they end up having an, uh, a significant impact on the water body and potentially on drinking water quality. And an example of that would be things like uh, pesticide runoff, uh, where pesticides have been applied quite correctly by the farmer uh, in the right weather conditions, uh, using the correct application right, rate on the correct uh, type, of, type of land, but slight, very small levels of runoff have occurred over a large area of river and in, in the and in the, the overall effect is at the abstraction point, for example, for the drinking water treatment works, that can equate to quite a significant level of pesticide. Whereas point source pollution uh, are, is, is something like a direct input from a water treatment work, uh, a wastewater treatment works or an industrial discharge directly into the water course inputs a large amount uh, of pollution. So what are some of the pollutants potentially impacting on water treatment? Well, gross organic pollution uh, can be a major issue uh, and that would arise from things such as uh, wastewater treatment discharges, slurry spills, uh, silage liquor, dairy waste, um, a spill of industrial effluents, all kinds of different sources. Nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, these can arise again from wastewater treatment discharges, but also from a fertilizer application to agricultural land. Soil particles, well, something you'll frequently see, I'm sure, and I, I know a lot of you would have reported in your uh, CSI reports on, on uh, when you monitor your rivers, uh, turbidity is frequently high in rivers, particularly after high rainfall. Well, a lot of that turbidity is due to suspended particles of topsoil, and this can have a considerable impact on the treatment process. Agrochemicals, we've, you know, we've already mentioned pesticides, they're quite high profile trace contaminants that you can get in, in drinking water, uh, raw drinking water. Heavy metals, these can be derived from road runoff, landfills, uh, wastewater treatment works, uh, outflows, uh, various, um, various inputs. Oils, obviously the oils are used widely in vehicles and all kinds of uh, applications and can enter rivers directly from uh, spills or sometimes uh, less directly from a drainage system. And colour, uh, Colour can arise, particularly in uh, uh, watercourses draining upland areas, which have got uh, PT humic soils. And you, you, those of you who work on the rivers like the Teen or the Dart or really any of the rivers draining the moors of the West Country at times will, well, not at times, will consistently see that. Uh, well, actually, I think it's quite a pleasant coloration to the water, but that 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 colour, if it becomes very intense, can pr 
um, present treatment challenges at the water treatment works. So what we'd like to do uh, is limit the levels of those pollutants in order to make water treatment more, e more easy. So many of you might have heard of uh, uh, a large environmental initiative called Upstream Thinking. Um, and this is one way in which uh, the, the quality of waters for, tr for treatment for drinking uh, are, uh, are be is being improved in the West Country. This is a Southwest Water funded initiative that was conceived back in the mid 2000s. So it's been running for quite a long time now. And the whole ethos of this really is about tackling pollution at source uh, rather than removing it during treatment. So rather than pouring a lot more concrete and doing a lot more engineering and making treatment works uh, larger and uh, more, more uh, capable of removing more and more pollutants, this is about stopping the pollutants getting in the water course in the first place, or at least minimising their ingress to water courses. And it's really got a, a two pronged benefit to it. This will enhance the biodiversity of, of, water of the water course, uh, and in some cases will increase carbon capture, especially in uh, upland areas. So there's a kind of ecological benefit, but then there's also a benefit from the drinking water point of view and in terms of improving uh, the quality and in some cases the quantity of raw water. This should, this should produce a considerable reduction in treatment costs because of uh, less of use, less treatment chemicals and less energy. Uh, and this, this program has been delivered or is but still being delivered in nine key drinking water catchments right across the whole southwest water region. Uh, and it's done in conjunction with a number of delivery partners of which West Country Rivers Trust is one. And so others, for example, are the uh, Wildlife Trust, the Devon and Cornwall, the Exmoor National Park Authority, uh, the Environment Agency, the University of Exeter and, and, and a number of others. So in essence, there at the bottom, what we're talking about is carrying out catchment in interventions leading to optimal land management and hopefully delivering enhanced ecology and improved raw water quality. Just a couple of examples of the so sorts of in interventions that are done under uh, under upstream thinking. At the top left there, I'm sure something you, well I know something you've all encountered is uh, access of uh, livestock to water courses causing uh, banks to be degraded, sediment inputs into rivers, but there's also the issue, especially from a drinking water perspective of, um, of livestock doing what that one there is doing, which is uh, operating one of its key bodily functions, shall we say. Uh, and this can neg certainly negatively uh, impact the quality of water in terms of um, presence of ammonia, presence of pathogenic organisms like E. coli, cryptosporidium. And so in the after photograph there, that stretch of uh, a river bank has been uh, fenced off. And this is the sort of uh, work that Upstream Thinking delivers, uh, sometimes match funding and sometimes grants to farmers to carry out that kind of that kind of work. And then at the bottom there, on the bottom left, that's an area of uh, Exmoor where there's been serious drying out and degradation of, of the peatlands up there. Uh, and the peat, uh, the sphagnum boss, sp sphagnum boss, sphagnum moss beds on high on moorland uh, performs a vital role as a sponge, really, in holding back water in times of heavy rainfall, releasing it more gently down the catchment. So we get less erosion, less colour, less turbidity in the water. Uh, uh, and what you can see on the right there, uh, has been done under something called the Myers project, which is part of upstream thinking. Um, the small dams have been in, installed to re-wet those uplands and allow them to re-establish sphagnum bog uh, and to hold back water in a way they would have done prior to uh, modification of the uplands to allow more grazing and uh, cause that degradation. That's also very important in terms of 
uh, re-establishing peat beds, which are extremely good, an extremely good means of uh, binding up carbon and um, uh, minimising effects on the climate due to uh, carbon dioxide being evolved when uh, peat breaks down. So that's just a couple of examples of what can be done under upstream thinking. But of course, we've got to treat our water, come what may, may no matter how good a job we do of protecting our raw waters, it will always require treatment before you or I can drink it. And so here is a basic water treatment process, and this, this applies really to uh, surface waters. The treatment of ground waters is frequently a lot more simple than this. So the water enters our plant from, uh, from a, a surface, a lake or a river or a reservoir perhaps. Uh, passes through some inlet screens, that's to take out gross material such as uh, tree branches, dead sheep, things of that nature. Uh, it may have its pH uh, adjusted and then it has some chemicals added to it, basically to remove a lot of the colour uh, and the finely divided uh, particulates that are in the water. This is a process called um, coagulation. So these chemicals which are added, they're usually aluminium or iron salts, and they are able to destabilize the fine dispersions of, uh, of clay, for example, that you get in, in water, make those particles uh, uh, agglomerate together, stick together, and they form something called a flock. And they can then settle out in sedimentation tanks, uh, and the water then pass the, that passes on has had most of its colour and uh, most of its colour and uh, its turbidity removed. That water is then filtered through uh, various different filter media, very often comprising of uh, sand beds, sometimes uh, granular activated carbon uh, to absorb uh, trace contaminants, and the water is then disinfected. Uh, often by chlorination uh, uh, and then uh, probably passes into a, a large clear water storage tank before it enters the distribution system uh, and passes out to uh, domestic properties uh, and to industry. So that's the basic water treatment process. But something that often applies is a bit of a out of sight, out of mind uh, out, outlook to water. So water falls out of the sky as rain. Um, it's it, why do I need to pay so much uh, for my water uh, overall? Well, there is more just to the fact that A, you have to treat that water before you drink it, but B, wastewater needs to be treated to an increasingly high standard before it returns to the environment. And uh, it's an interesting fact that if you look at your typical water bill for almost everyone, their wastewater treatment uh, charge is significantly higher than their water supply charge, and, and that's for a good reason. So water water is, is disposed of down the toilet, down the sink, down the bath, uh, also down roadside drains as well. Um, and ultimately will end up at sewage treatment works. Well, sewage treatment works by design are very efficient at concentrating up potential pollutants. Uh, that's what we want them to do, in fact. But accidental discharges or operation of what are called CSOs, so combined sewer overflows, uh, or substandard treatment processes uh, can certainly adversely affect local ecology. And some of you may unfortunately have seen evidence of wastewater contamination when you've been out on 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 the riverbank, uh, often um, often um, highlighted by the presence of grey looking sewage fungus, for example. Um, increasingly high standards of treatment are required to ensure effluents imply, um, comply with modern regulatory requirements, and it's a very costly. Um, process. And what is a very important point is in the overall water cycle, uh, residual pollutants in wastewater uh, can have pretty significant impacts on downstream drinking water treatment plants 
And uh, there's an old joke that if you drink the water in London, you're about the 10th person the water has been through uh, or something of that nature. Uh, that's that's actually often often the case. So in, in the West Country, it wouldn't be that number of people, but major water drinking water abstractions downstream of uh, wastewater treatment works discharges are, are are not that rare. So a couple of examples would be Pines Water Treatment Works just north of Exeter and Little Hempston Water Treatment Works uh, near Totnes, which has got quite a significant sewage discharge uh, upstream of it at Buckfast Lee. So it's obviously very important that the sewage treatment process uh, works efficiently and does its job properly. Sewage treatment is a is a challenge uh, just because of the scale of it really. So in the southwest water region alone there are over well over 600 water sewage treatment works. So contrast that with the fact that there are I think 31 water treatment works uh, and the nature of those works varies massively. So the catchment of those sewage works varies hugely in size uh, from um, many very small rural works treating wastewater just from uh, tens of properties perhaps up to very large works such as uh, Plymouth Central, Marsh Mills, Ashford, Countess Weir, they're all uh, pretty large sewage treatment works, some of them treating sewage from catchment areas of uh, well over a hundred thousand people uh, and the nature of the influence influence streams can vary hugely so although a lot of works treat um, treat sewage primarily from domestic inputs there are others that uh, would include uh, considerable uh, inputs from industrial discharges hospitals an airport perhaps and that means you can uh, get a huge range of pollutants present uh, in crude sewage. So obviously, to put it politely, there tends to be quite a lot of gross organic solids. Uh, a lot of nutrients, so things like ammonia and phosphates, gross inorganic materials, grit, gravel, all those kinds of things. Lots of detergents from cleaning products, heavy metals, which can be very uh, problematic in terms of en environmental toxicity but also certainly you do not want present in drinking water at any appreciable concentration uh, and then a whole plethora of trace organic compounds so the, these are carbon compounds uh, things arising from personal care products pharmaceuticals flame retardants plasticizers artificial fragrances pesticides I could go on so sewage treatment uh, has to deal with all of those things and what is interesting is actually a lot of sewage works were constructed a long time ago when there was a far lower understanding of the cross-section of pollute, trace pollutants that are present and we were, they were only really designed to take out the gross pollution so many sewage works have had to be replaced or their infrastructure upgraded in order to uh, deal with the sort of trace contaminants such as heavy metals and those organic compounds. There are a couple of main sewage treatment processes. Uh, so on the top left there, those are the tanks of, of an activated sludge plant. Uh, on the right there at the top uh, is a second type of process, main process. That's a trickling filter works, which you'd often see at small, smaller sewage treatment sewage treatment works also sometimes known as a percolating filter plant. So just like uh, trying to improve the influent to uh, water treatment works, we'd like to um, receive crude sewage that contains uh, lower levels of pollution and hopefully lower volumes of it as well. So there is a kind of sister environmental initiative to upstream thinking called uh, very imaginatively downstream thinking. Um, it's a fact that there's been a massive increase in the volume and the intensity of surface uh, water runoff uh, in recent times. And that's a function of increasing urbanisation with 
uh, a lot more hard surfaces, creating conditions where runoff can easily occur. But it's also related to the more intense rainfall that we are undeniably seeing more frequently now uh, 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 as a function of climate change. This results in um, fairly frequent sewer flooding, which of course is an absolute nightmare for uh, anyone who uh, has the awful experience of that happening to their property. And also the operation of combined sewer overflows, which I, I mentioned earlier. So, so CSOs uh, tend to operate when sewage treatment works are overwhelmed with a volume of, uh, of uh, influent. Uh, typically occurring during a storm events, and so this is a this is a function of uh, combined drainage systems where surface water, uh, rather than discharging directly into watercourses, actually enters the the wastewater uh, network, uh, 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 and added to the normal sewage flow in there, it puts a massive strain uh, on on sewage treatment works. And the resultant pollution of water courses uh, we can get from uh, things like uh, CSOs um, operating uh, can be very negative in terms of ecology. It can certainly impact bathing waters, and that's something we frequently hear about where uh, coastal discharges occur. Uh, shell fisheries can be uh, affected, but also the quality of raw water sources used in, in drinking water production can be impacted. Um, so the excessive volumes of wastewater that produced can contain uh, more pollutants, some of which we've mentioned earlier. Um, this all results in increased pumping and treatment costs uh, and also means the carbon footprint of, of the processes uh, is increased. So downstream thinking aims to work with nature really to minimise the ingress of surface water to the sewer network uh, via the use of of something called SUDS, which you may have heard of, Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems. And the types of measures this involves includes things like use of ponds, ditches and rain gardens to filter and store rainwater, uh, and also to try and move away from the use of combined drainage systems. Having said all of that, of course, though, we do have to treat our crude sewage. Oh, 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 sorry, there I moved on a, a little before I intended. So here are just some examples of the things that uh, I've done under a, a downstream thinking. As I said, ponds on the top left there, ditches, something I didn't mention there on the bottom left, reed beds. Reed beds are uh, very effective uh, at uh, binding and breaking down trace contaminants. So particularly a lot of the trace organic contaminants we mentioned earlier, but they're also very good at immobilizing heavy metal pollutants. And so, uh, 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 and then on the bottom right there, you've got uh, a, a rain garden. And these, as well as uh, contributing to minimizing runoff, to improving water quality, of course, all of, and a very important issue is that all of these uh, installations help to green urban areas and uh, that without a doubt has a major beneficial effect, uh, impact on people's uh, quality of life. We do have to treat our sewage though. Uh, so here is a basic uh, water treatment process. So the raw sewage enters the works, passes through screens which remove uh, uh, large material that might be in there. Um, uh, bits of bits of wood and other 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 um, other larger items. Uh, screenings are particularly unpleasant. Anyone who used to have analysed them in the lab used to have my my deep sympathy because they contain all manner of things like sanitary towels and condoms and all sorts of horrible things. But those screenings are removed. Uh, the uh, grit and gravel in the sewage is removed in a, in a grit chamber and taken off and then the sewage enters the primary settlement stage and this is where the heavy organic solids are settled out, take removed uh, and uh, as sludge uh, and that sludge is treated in a number of different ways. Typically it's uh, it's digested 
and then the digested sludge may be dried and pelletized and can be used in energy production but often it is disposed of to land so um, it, it has to then obviously be uh, very carefully screened for, for pollutants and also has to be sterilized by a process such as liming but then the primary effluent which is now a lot cleaner passes through into uh, an aeration tank, which I mentioned earlier. And in that aeration tank, uh, bacterial oxidation occurs of the uh, remaining organic material that's in the, in the sewage. Uh, the, um, the effluent then passes through a secondary clarifier uh, where some of that um, the sludge produced by in the aeration process, which is essentially biomass, is taken off. Uh, and then that secondary effluent may be disinfected, typically by um, something such as uh, ultraviolet treatment. And in many cases, it's then discharged back into the, into the river. So we have now come full cycle. But increasingly now, um, some kind of tertiary treatment is required. So I should have said the primary treatment is that kind of settlement process, removal of the sludge. The secondary treatment is that aeration. Tertiary treatment is now required in many cases to remove trace contaminants, those sorts of trace organics, uh, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that now that we have a better understanding of their impact on the environment uh, and need to be removed. And that can involve things such as using adsorption on carbon, uh, specialised oxidation processes, uh, membrane filtration processes, and by their very nature, all of those um, processes are quite uh, expensive in terms of energy uh, and in terms of carbon footprint, and in terms of treatment. So it is very much in all of our interests for us to um, limit the levels of those things that enter the sewage system. So this is the sort of reason, folks, why you don't want to be disposing of uh, waste pharmaceuticals down the toilet. So how do the test parameters that you typically um, carry out in your work out on a riverbank uh, relate to drinking water? What kind of drinking water impacts and the parameters that you measure have. And so you'd all be familiar with these three basic tests of phosphate, total dissolved solids or, or conductivity uh, and turbidity, stroke colour. So phosphate uh, is, an, is an indicator of the propensity of a water to form uh, blooms of algae. So phosphate arising from um, uh, uh, agricultural runoff of fertilizers or mainly mainly from that or wastewater discharges is able to support the formation of algal blooms. Uh, these can have considerable uh, ecological impacts in terms of uh, excluding light, uh, excluding light from the river, uh, causing uh, oxygen depletion uh, when, when blooms become very large. But they can also have significant drinking water impacts. So algal blooms can often produce taste and odour tainting compounds. Uh, for example, that earthy um, taste that water derived from uh, um, lowland surface reservoirs can sometimes uh, exhibit comes from a compound called geosmin. So it's the same compound that you would smell when it rains for the first time in a very long time, that earthy that earthy uh, smell, that's an algal metabolite. It's not particularly easy to rem remove from water and very low levels of it can produce uh, that kind of taste. We can also get production of algal toxins, which uh, uh, are quite nasty compounds that have to be removed during treatment. And in fact, just the presence of a lot of algae can make the water treatment process more difficult. Um, Total dissolved solids, well, this can be an indicator of contamination of, of water courses by um, uh, wastewaters. Uh, and there are all kinds of ecological impacts from things like uh, ammonia, metals, uh, endocrine disrupting compounds. Uh, but also, uh, again, we can get oxygen depletion, 
um, from wastewater, the presence of wastewater because bacterial breakdown in the organics that are present and also impact from nutrients. But in terms of wastewater, again, in terms of drinking water, there are also significant impacts. So we can have potential contamination of water with pathogens. So E. coli is one you've probably heard of, cryptosporidium, things like that. We can have all kinds of uh, potential uh, harmful, potentially harmful trace contaminants. And it all means that we need to use a more complex water treatment process. And turbidity, well, that's an indicator of soil erosion, can be an indicator of soil erosion, wastewater inputs, a degradation of upland peat bogs, which we've already mentioned. Um, and that can result in things like sediment deposition in water courses, exclusion of light, um, um, absorbed contaminants being transported into the water course on soil particles, and it can also raise the temperature of, of water courses. So there can be all kinds of, envir of environmental impacts, including things like effects on uh, spawning grounds for salmonid fish. But again, there are significant drinking water impacts. So really all of the issues we talked about under total dissolved solids apply, but also in the water treatment process, we can get excessive disinfection byproduct formation. So what that means is when we chlorinate our water to st sterilize it, make it microbiologically safe, some of that chlorine can react with the background uh, organic material that's present and it is related to that high turbidity. Uh, and it can produce byproducts such as uh, chloroform and related compounds, some of which uh, at excessive levels can be uh, carcinogenic, carcinogenic cancer causing. And they are very strictly um, uh, regulated in drinking water, as you would expect. But the fact that they're there in such high concentrations because of the quality of the raw water that's been used means once again, we have to use a more complex and costly treatment process. So really the overall impacts of these parameters that you would measure fairly frequently is reduced drinking water quality, more, more complex treatment processes, uh, increased use of treatment chemicals, a higher carbon footprint and higher water bills for us all because of uh, increased treatment costs. So that's really all I've got to say, folks. Um, but I'd just like you really, to, in signing off, for you to remember three things. So first of all, your, how important your work is, not just in terms of the well-being of our rivers, but also the quality of our drinking water. How grateful we are to all of you for all your efforts, because uh, you know what you do makes a increasingly large uh, contribution in both of those areas and really how grateful I am for uh, taking time out of your no doubt busy days to listen to me rambling on so be glad to try and answer any questions you might have and uh, going forward if there's anything comes to mind you think I could uh, I could help help with in any way then please don't hesitate to email me there at the uh, displayed email address Thank you very much for uh, for listening. Thank you, Ian. That was really good um, and really interesting. So as Ian mentioned, he is available to take any of your questions. Um, if you want to put them in the Q&A, as I said earlier, there is um, a slight delay in in how it works. So. Um, don't worry if if you find that you put something in and it's a while till we answer it. But I just have a, a question, Mr. T, about the plastic side of things. Yeah. You see, are you were saying that, that that wastewater treatment works and and maybe water treatment works as well? I presume have tried had to would it would you say they've had to adapt to more plastic entering the system? Um, I think the treatment processes are already pretty efficient at removing um, plastic particulates and, and 
another another thing that's talked about well a lot, a lot it's talked about a lot now as well are fibers arriving arising from uh, washing fabrics and things like that the fact that um those treatment processes do employ uh, filtration steps mean that um they are pretty efficient at removing um uh, microplastics that's not to say that there won't be very low levels of them i think you probably in drinking water because there will be plastic and there will be some plastic fittings present and typically in your own property there might be quite a few and therefore yeah. there is the facility for the input of um of plastic particulates there but i yeah. think um the direct break direct breakdown in the environment of plastic that's just been disposed of I would I would personally imagine would be a much greater means of uh, input of microplastics into the environment. Mm -hmm. but, um, one example in what I talked about there is probably um, microscopic particles of rubber probably are uh, uh, frequently uh, input into water courses for road runoff, you know, mm -hmm. break the tires and things like that. Yeah. So we, we have a question from Patrick, who's um, in Teenmouth. He says, what about the problem of leaks? How big a factor is this in the overall challenge of providing drinking water? Well, leakage is an area that uh, water companies are very much under the microscope um, uh, in, in terms of the, their performance and it's um, an area that the likes of Offwatt, which is their, their financial regular and, the, and uh, the drinking water inspector have very much been on water companies cases uh, in terms of leaks uh, for a long time now. And uh, many aspects of water company performance are governed by performance tables. So uh, it's a bit like the Premier League, but you don't want to be at the top of this one. And, uh, so I can't give you statistics for uh, Southwest Water's leakage performance, but I know for a fact that leakage has been dramatically reduced uh, in recent years. It's something that requires continued work, uh, and it's certainly part of us using water more efficiently, uh, but it needs linking to a lot of other things like people's own usage of water in terms of um, how prudently they use it, using water butts for uh, water in your garden, not wasting all that water that falls on the roof, for example, is just one thing you can do, uh, you know, and obviously there are all kinds of plumbing in, um, initiatives now with low flush toilets and all those things. It needs taking in, in conjunction with that, but yes, it's, it's still an important issue that needs uh, more work uh, and the fact is that there are still large areas of water distribution systems in um, water companies that are aging shall we say uh, need to be upgraded. Um, so Jenny from, from WRT, uh, do cleaning products which claim to be biodegradable still require treatment or do they totally break down by themselves? That's interesting Jenny yeah biodegradability is a uh, is a bit of a hot potato really isn't it uh, you hear about so-called biodegradable plastics that well don't break down very fast and actually if you have them in certain conditions don't really break down at all um it's likely to be a question of the rate of decomposition really so those products i would imagine if they were put directly out in the environment uh, may take quite a long time to break down and may have some damaging properties. A sewage treatment works uh, employs processes designed to break down organic compounds really and therefore if those are compounds that are fairly amenable to being decomposed and I'm talking off the top of my head here now I've not looked into studies of this I would expect them to be broken down pretty efficiently in a wastewater treatment works. Mm. Well. Um, so Penny says, um, very interested in the use of aeration process as part of secondary treatment. Mm -hmm. Are there natural processes that produce aeration as an anti-pollution measure? 
I'd be interested to learn more about how we can increase oxygen levels in rivers, especially at times of drought. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, certainly when there is a, often when there's a fish kill in a river, that's due to the input of excessive organic uh, pollution uh, and the bacterial breakdown processes that uh, that remove that material, the respiration of the bacteria consumes all the oxygen in the river. And uh, in extreme cases, the EA will go around doing things like putting hydrogen peroxide into the river, which is um, pretty extreme case, but that's to reoxygenate the river. Um, in terms of natural processes that would result in oxygenation, well, um, a healthy uh, flora in a river, so um, uh, sort of macrophytes, bigger plants, uh, and a river that's not too turbid to stop uh, light ingress is going to produce uh, a healthy amount of oxygen. That's how the ecosystem should be working, and that's good. That's that is the major byproduct of photosynthesis, and therefore. Uh, that is naturally how a river, or one of the ways, as, as well as the river flowing and therefore getting in trained air in it, that is a major way in which a river, a healthy river should be oxygenated. Um, whether there are specific means that you can go out and naturally reoxygenate a river other than that, I wouldn't like to say, I don't know if you've got a comment on that side. Not, not really, except I would say, you know, it's, it comes down to the importance of having as much river, as much water in our rivers in low flows as we can, you know, so again, through improving catchment condition and, and hydrologic function, really. And I also think that some of the work around temperature management in rivers, so ensuring you've got, you know, tree cover, keep the temperature down. So you can't, it's difficult to directly influence the oxygen, but you can influence some of the factors that you know, we'll, we'll remove it. So increased temperature and, you know, the more water there, the better. Yeah, and also reduce turbidity because um, the presence of turbidity in a river is actually can result in it, in it becoming under the influence of sunlight, uh, uh, warming up. And yeah, that maintaining flows in times of, um, of drought, that is one of the aims of that pump recharge scheme which I was talking about where water is pumped up into uh, upland reservoirs in um, in times of high flow and then reduced and then and then released uh, during times of drought so those three strategic reservoirs are able to top up the flows essentially in the 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 foy the tamer and the x during those conditions there are there can be associated issues with that though it's not I don't think it's a strategy that should be the absolute be all and end all really. So we've got one question from Annie in Lou who says do soap pods from washing machines etc cause a problem? Meaning the material they're made of or what's in them? I suppose she means the material that they're made of by the look of that question. I don't know. She doesn't specify. Yeah, um, well, they're generally designed to be water soluble. Um, so that they obviously so that they release the contents into your washing. Um, exactly what they're made of. I don't know. Um, I presume they shouldn't be, for example, adding microplastics unless any of the contents of them include those. But um, I, I, I would imagine they are probably fairly well removed from waste, wastewater, those compounds. But I, I'd, I'd have to look into that a bit more to answer that properly, really. Yeah. Um, so we've got one from Anne Hill. Um, could house design be improved so that less treated water could go into toilet flush systems? Well, um, grey water is something that uh, grey water systems are used a lot in other countries 
Um, so I mentioned the use of water butts and things like that for water in your garden. But in quite a lot of countries, grey water is used for exactly that sort of thing. Uh, so it's water collected, say, from roof runoff or something like that. And that is used uh, inside the house, inside your property for applications where, you know, microbiological um, purity of your water is not and an ultra high quality is not is not necessarily required. Flushing your toilet would be a key one there, obviously, and it's a major user of uh, water if you looked at the volume that's that's used. So that that's that's the sort of thing. So you, you use a grey water really. If you look up grey water systems, you'll see examples of, of how that's used. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, just just one here from from Annie who who asked about the soap suds. She just said clarified that material they are made of. So yeah. I think you answered that. Yeah. Um, so we've got one from an anonymous person who says, "What should we be looking for in domestic cleaning products to minimise pollution? Are eco products better?" So similar to what Jenny asked. What should we be looking at in domestic? What cleaning products? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those eco products fundamentally will be better. And much as sometimes claims are made for materials that are subsequently proved not to be uh, the case, there is pretty close regulation in terms of uh, the content of, of products such as that and their efficacy, shall we say. So I think you can be confident that if you use them, you are having uh, a lower impact environmentally and potentially on drinking water. Um, I think a comment I would make is it'd be very hard for us to come up with products that don't have any impact at all, really. Um, that's just our modern way of life and our requirements from it. And, we can green it a lot and still there will be an impact. It's a question of minimising it. And I would say if you are careful like that, at least you are heading in the right direction. I think it's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, that's true. Well, thank thank you for that, Mr T. We're, we're heading on to 12 o'clock now, so we'll we'll wrap it up. But thank you, everybody, for your questions. And a particular thank you to, to Mr T for an excellent presentation for our July CSI webinar. That was really great. Thank you. Um, so any other questions you do have, you can either email them to CSI at WRT.org.uk or straight to Ian, um, Ian at WRT.org.uk. So um, you're very welcome to, to let us know if you have any other questions. Um, but yeah, again, thank you everybody for coming along. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and you got something from it. Um, we will be having our August webinar around the same time next month. Thank you everybody and have a good day. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you for joining our July West Country CSI webinar. I hope you enjoyed it, found it informative and inspiring. If you would like to learn more about West Country CSI or West Country Rivers Trust, just email us csi at wrt.org.uk. You're welcome to join our Facebook group or sign up to our newsletter with the links on the screen. Thank you.